Welcome to e-Estonia, Governance in Practice. Bienvenidos a e-Estonia, Gobernanza en Práctica. Es un gusto eh, conversar sobre este diálogo sobre lecciones clave aprendidas de la transformación digital en Estonia. We will dialogue on key lessons learned from the digital transformation in Estonia. Welcome to this event. Bienvenidos a este evento organizado por el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Antes de comenzar, me gustaría compartir con ustedes algunas indicaciones prácticas, logísticas, para que podamos eh, llevar adelante este webinar de la mejor manera posible. Si tiene alguna pregunta, por favor, utilice el espacio de preguntas y respuestas, indicando su nombre, país, institución y a quién va dirigida su pregunta. Para interpretación, puede hacer clic en el icono de interpretación en forma de mundo en los controles y ahí seleccionar el idioma que desea escuchar. Tengo el honor, el agrado de presentar en primer lugar al moderador Miguel Porrúa, coordinador del clúster de datos y gobierno digital del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Adelante, por favor, Miguel Porrua. Muchas gracias, Roberto. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna be, we're gonna be moving between um, English and Spanish throughout the, the journey, uh, since we have uh, panelists from that speak both languages. So uh, please allow me to switch from one to the other. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us in this. Uh, this activity that we see, we at the Inter-American Development Bank see as, as a very exciting one because we are launching a publication that uh, I think will be of, we think will be of great value for those of you that are leading digital transformation projects or are just supporting them or are just part of teams that lead digital transformation projects in the region because we are uh, uh, bringing it to you the experience of a recognized country like Estonia. Uh, actually, the book that we're launching today is, is quite comprehensive. Uh, it has uh, the history of uh, digital in Estonia, uh, the main achievements, the main components, the regulatory aspect, the, the digital talent, the human talent aspect. So uh, it is quite a comprehensive uh, presentation of what Estonia has done. So. Uh, and uh, let me, before I, I, I mention the quality of uh, the panelists that uh, uh, will join me in this, in this activity, let me just remind to you what, what type of country we're talking about and, and why we're so excited about launching this publication. Estonia is uh, number third in the United Nations uh, e-government ranking worldwide. It is uh, number five in the European Union uh, Digital Economy Society Index, uh, the TESI of the European Union, number five. It is number three in the ITU Cybersecurity Security Global uh, Report. Uh, it has 99% of the government services online, according to the publication itself. Uh, it has 98% of the medical prescriptions issued digitally, and 46% uh, of the votes in the latest local elections were cast online. Just to give you an idea of, of the remarkable progress that Estonia has experienced in, in digital and the value of, of uh, this publication and, and the exchange we're gonna have. And I'm very excited that we're having with us uh, Hannes Astok, uh, the executive director of EGA, eGovernance Academy. We're also having in the panel uh, Marushka Chocobar, the secretary for digital government in the government of Peru. And we're also having Devindra Ramarine, uh, the ICT digital advisor uh, to the Ministry of Digital Transformation in the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, top-notch uh, panel that we are thankful uh, for, for having the opportunity to, to have you in this, this exchange. I will go into details about the valuable experience of each one of you once I start uh, uh, posing the questions. 
Uh, and uh, I would like to start with you, Hannes, obviously, because uh, we are uh, here thanks to the great job that you guys is doing in digital government and in the spreading the, spreading the world worldwide about the, what, what Estonia has done. And uh, I have to say you were very generous and, and charm welcoming a delegation from Caribbean countries that visited Tallinn some years ago, along with the managers from the IDB. You participated in several Red Health meetings in the region. Uh, and uh, we have to say thank you. Thank you to the former president, Thomas Hilfs. Thank you to Sim Sikut, to Arvot, to many Estonians like you that were very generous in coming into our region, in sharing knowledge with Latin American and Caribbean countries. And this publication is just one more step in that effort that you have done to get the knowledge of Estonia closer to Latin American and Caribbean countries. So for that, thank you so much, Hans. Uh, you are at this point a friend, not just of mine, I would say a friend of, of the region. So thank you for joining us. Let me ask you the first question that is, is hard to avoid, which is, tell us how did it all start? How did Estonia jump into this digital uh, successful trajectory? And uh, what were the key elements of success? Why did you do it so well? Okay, hey, thank you very much, Miguel, for kind words. Buenos dias, everyone. Uh, my Spanish is very limited, so let me speak in, in English, but I try, I, I promise to improve in next years. So, um, uh, yes, Estonia started its digital government journey, let's say, roughly 25 years ago. And the starting position, I think, was very similar to many countries in, in those years. But also maybe, maybe also later, but we do not have in Estonia too much uh, uh, natural resources, but we do not have oil, we do not have, have gas, we do not have gold mines, <laughs> so we need to be smart. And also Estonia is a very small country, 1.3 million people only. And this means that um, uh, we cannot afford also very like a fat public administration. So we need to be smart and also take a look what we can do with technology. And I think ICT, information and communication technologies, are, are very useful in this case. If you do not have too many people, if you don't want to have big administration. So, so basically what we started with from understanding that we need to make data moving, not push people move in between the institutions. So based on this understanding that let's share the data inside the government um, um, uh, to serve the people for various purposes, to plan better the government services, to uh, provide online services for uh, uh, citizens and businesses. So, so this understanding helps us to move forward very much with the digital solutions. And, and definitely we made a lot of mistakes in this journey because we were starting and today, many people are saying that you do everything by the book. Actually, 25 years ago, there was no book, book written. The book is here currently, what you can read. So, but the success factors, what Miguel asked, is definitely that you need to be, uh, have like an open, open mindset and open approach in the government. So you, you must allow also government institutions and their in, initiative leaders to experiment. You need to have political will to support it. Uh, you need to have good innovation atmosphere and also engagements both universities and um, IT companies to this game. So it cannot be closed circle only inside the government, but very much kind of open innovation space where you can experiment and discuss together with all stakeholders how to make country better, how to make it more efficient, how to make it more transparent. And definitely you need to have in place also financing but uh, but i think even financing itself is 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 either it's important it's not the critical success factor critical success for factor is political will and open open innovation atmosphere what you can create in any government thank you thank you hannes and, and that kind of 
comprehensive view transpires from, from the document for those of you that you had a, a look at it um, before. Um, we'll come back to some of the points that you mentioned that I would like to go deeper, but let me go to our uh, next panelist, uh, Maruska. And for that, I'm going to switch to Spanish. So those of you that want to follow, you can go to interpretation, as Roberto said, and, and switch. Um, Maruska, buenos días. ¿Cómo estás, Miguel? Muchas Un gusto gracias. Estar con Muchas gracias por unirte a esta conversación con ese paisaje tan lindo de fondo y tan reconocido en la región. De, de Machu Picchu. Eh, mira, yo quería eh, una, pues lógicamente las agendas digitales de, de todos los que estamos aquí fueron afectadas eh, por el COVID, ¿verdad? Y, y nosotros desde el banco hicimos una investigación acerca de cómo eh, la transformación digital eh, había apoyado la gestión de, del COVID, una publicación en la que una de las cosas que nos llamó la atención en el caso de Perú fue que durante el COVID eh, el porcentaje de ciudadanos que nos indicó que había hecho la última transacción en línea subió del 28% al 61%, o sea, más que se duplicó ¿no? el uso de, de los ciudadanos de, de las transacciones en línea. Entonces la pregunta es, cuéntanos un poco eh, el esfuerzo que hizo el gobierno de Perú en ese periodo para poder atender justamente a ese ciudadano que buscaba más los servicios en línea y se te sirvió de inspiración Estonia. ¿Qué, ¿Qué utilizaste de Estonia como inspiración? Que tú eres una estudiosa de qué pasa en el mundo y habías escuchado ya en las actividades de Red Real de Estonia. Así que cuéntanos un poco, Maruska. Gracias. Claro que sí, claro que sí Miguel. Muchas gracias por esta invitación. Eh, definitivamente nosotros nos hemos inspirado en el modelo de Estonia. El 2018 estuvo acá el expresidente de Estonia con una misión del BID para un evento eh, nacional y tomamos muchas de las recomendaciones, sobre todo en materia de gobierno digital. ¿no? En ese momento hablábamos de interoperabilidad y toda la plataforma eh, que tiene líder Estonia, hablábamos de identidad digital, de servicios digitales, de arquitectura, de datos y de todo lo que involucra la seguridad digital. Con eso, lo que hicimos fue tomar el modelo y plasmarlo en una ley. A los pocos meses que estuvo el presidente aquí, el expresidente de Estonia, lanzamos la ley de gobierno digital basada en esa estructura, septiembre del 2018. Continuamos, y ya en el camino ¿no? con, con el BIT, eh, y también de la mano con la OCDE, Cooperación Internacional en general, eh, comenzamos a seguir la línea de la OCDE con respecto a cómo transformamos el gobierno electrónico al gobierno digital, y comenzamos, como bien ha mencionado Hannes, no sé cómo se pronuncia Hannes, eh, todo este esquema de innovación abierta, ¿verdad? De, de poder unir esfuerzos público-privado para todo el esquema de gobierno digital. 2020, dos meses antes de la crisis sanitaria, nos centramos en ampliar la fortaleza del gobierno digital hacia un esquema de transformación digital, donde ya entra la economía digital, las plataformas de intermediación, el comercio electrónico, siempre con una base de seguridad digital. Eh, ¿Qué te puedo mencionar ahí? Efectivamente, 61% de acuerdo al estudio del BID de personas en el Perú comenzó a utilizar trámites en línea. Impulsamos muchísimo durante la pandemia todo el, el esquema de mesas de partes digitales, la plataforma nacional de identidad digital que está en proceso de, de implementación y todo lo que involucra la interoperabilidad debajo. Números que me gustaría comentarte, el Perú facturó cerca de 9 mil millones de dólares el 2021 en comercio electrónico. Es decir, un impacto directo a la reactivación económica. Estamos trabajando en el reconocimiento transfronterizo de la identidad con el primer ejemplo del carnet de vacunación, ¿verdad? Que estamos impulsando con el BID. Más de 60.000 comercios en mercados, en los mercados de abasto de, cercanos a la ciudadanía, usan hoy billeteras digitales. Una de cada seis compras que se hacen en el Perú ya es por Internet. Eh, y, por, y por último, 61%, 56% de las tiendas que son hoy digitales tienen apenas un año, es decir, la pandemia definitivamente ha sido un catalizador y creo que lo que estamos impulsando ahora sobre la base de la inspiración de Estonia es cómo nos convertimos en unos fortalecidos de la ciudadanía digital, que es la base de la política nacional de transformación digital, Miguel. Gracias. Excelente, Maruska. Y ahora que la audiencia te oyó, eh, permítame que cuente lo que debería haber contado al principio, que es un poquito de quién es Maruska. ¿no? Y por eso van a entender su intervención de hace un momento. Maruska... Fue gerente de Microsoft, o sea, tiene experiencia en el sector privado. 
tiene muchos años de experiencia en el sector público y es eh, ingeniera industrial. Es una de esas mujeres eh, duras de la disciplina STEM, de la famosa disciplina STEM, de ciencias, matemáticas, ingeniería, eh, de esas mujeres que son, yo creo, una referencia para la región y que necesitamos eh, tener muchas más en la región. Así que confío en que haya muchas mujeres es, escuchando, que se entusiasmen, oyéndote, Marushka, con eh, el potencial que trae la mujer profesional en, este, en estos temas a la transformación digital y ojalá inspires a muchas otras colegas y a las hijas de nuestras colegas que te estén inspirando porque en la región eres una referencia como mujer campeona del gobierno digital. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Miguel. Muchas gracias. Volveré, volveré a ti, no te relajes que volveré, que tengo algunas preguntas más. But I would like to switch back to, to English eh, to uh, talk to Devindra. Devindra, thank you for joining us. Eh, and actually, I should start by congratulating the government of Trinidad and Tobago on the recent uh, creation of the Ministry of Digital Transformation. That on itself sends, I think, uh, a clear message, not just to, to, to the Trinitarians, but to the whole region about the importance of digital transformation for the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So congratulations on that. Devindra, again, uh, another profile along the lines of Marushka, a person like you with experience in the private sector, in Ernst and Jan and other consulting companies with a long trajectory in the public sector as well, and, and also a, a, an engineer, an industrial engineer with masters in telecommunications. So kind of the perfect profile, Devindra, for your role. Thank you for joining us. And um, uh, actually, I wonder in, in the efforts to, uh, to plan on, on this the new ministry and the new agenda of this ministry that, that we've had some exchanges and, and you have very interesting plans to transform the country digitally. Uh, what, what inspiration have you taken from, from Estonia? Because uh, Trinidad well, was one of the first countries that I think Arbot visited in the region, the former executive director of IGA and the predecessor of Hannes. So uh, you, you've kind of heard about Estonia very, at the very early stage. So can you share with us what inspiration did you bring into Trinidad from, from Estonia, Dimitri? Thanks very much, Miguel. And thanks very much for having me on the panel. So uh, as some of you may be aware that Trinidad and Tobago is basically a gas and oil economy. And what we saw was the opportunity to use digital or ICT to transform or to diversify the economy. So simultaneously with uh, you know, digitizing government. We also wanted to use that opportunity to, to grow the digital economy itself. Um, we also wanted to do it in what we are calling Mokojambi steps. And that's really mean big strides. We don't want to do things incrementally. We want to do things rapidly. In order for us to do that, we couldn't really partner with traditional uh, uh, vendors. We really needed to partner with, uh, with an organization that will help us develop an organization that we could learn from, an organization that we can grow with. And um, that worked out quite well when we identified Estonia as a potential partner for us to work with. So there were a couple of things that were attractive about Estonia. Firstly, the, 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 all the progress that they've made, which has been described by others in terms of putting services online, and as well as developing solutions that uh, kind of fit the mold that is required for Trinidad. So if you look at the size of Estonia compared to the size of Trinidad, we're about 1.4 million, Estonia is 1.3 million. So the challenges of having limited resources in areas of specialization, very similar to the challenges Estonia would have gone through years ago. So the fit was very, very good. So we wanted to take the opportunity to align ourselves and we therefore pursued an MOU. So we do have an arrangement directly with the government of Estonia itself and that government, the government itself is pointing us to agencies that we could work with in very specific areas of focus. The other attractive thing that we found about Estonia is that, as, as I mentioned before, we want to do big steps. We don't want to do small steps. We want to be agile. We don't want to plan things to the end degree and then realize using the waterfall method that we needed to adapt. We needed an organization or a partner that could be agile and work along with us. We wanted uh, to have a little bit of a focus on bringing in the private sector as partners. 
we came up with the concept of, which other co countries are doing, but the concept of a developer's hub. So the idea of partnering almost in three parts, Estonia, government, our systems, our uh, support system, like our eGov company, as well as the private sector and the developers hub to work in partnership. And that is something that Estonia is very, very supportive of. Yeah. And then thirdly, we wanted to have a regional perspective as well, in the sense that what we do in, in Trinidad and Tobago, we wanted to be able to expand and to partner with other countries. And again, Estonia with its regional presence fit in. So all in all, the alignment was great. Yeah. Uh, the ability to work the way that we wanted to work in, uh, Estonia was very comfortable with. So hence the reason why we are progressing quite rapidly with the, this Estonian relationship. Thank you, Devindra. And you touch upon a point <clears throat> that I will bring later on with, with Hannes, which is the private sector role. But before um, um, before I go to the private sector, Hannes, um, let me get back to you. Um, and actually, uh, I, I want to um, share with, with the audience who are you. And that's why your, uh, your words have a special value. We're talking about the former a vice mayor of Tartu, your hometown. So a person that has, that has hands-on experience in managing a public institution and providing services at a municipality, the second, second biggest in Estonia. We're talking about a former member of parliament. You're a former member of parliament. So you know about legislation, you know about the policy uh, negotiations and, and, deal, and, and dealings. And you're a journalist as well. So you know how to communicate and that always helps. I, I'm sure Roberto Lopez, the manager of RedTel, who is a journalist himself, is glad that you're part of that club. And obviously now current uh, executive director uh, and chairman of the management board of, of EGA, a uh, recognized uh, think tank and provider of knowledge and training and expertise throughout the world in, in digital government. So uh, we feel now more privileged to have you in this conversation, Hannes. Now back to, Back to the book, you mentioned, and, and rightly so, that there were people were asking you, okay, what, what was the manual? What, what book did you follow in Estonia? You said, listen, we, we were basically writing the book right? as, as we were going. So in hindsight, uh, now that the book is written, but what would you have done differently from what we see in that book that we're launching today? I mean, from what you've learned. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you in, for introducing me in this way. I think most of the people are asking, but okay, this guy is journalist and former politician, but what he knows about technology. <laughs> but, but I think my sample also shows that uh, to build proper digital government, it's not only about technology. It's, not, it's very much about setting the scene, agreeing the solution, trying to understand the value for the citizens and, um, and building it up together definitely with the talented engineers, but you, you need also a lot of other people rather than talented engineers. If talented engineers themselves do e-government, it probably will fail because also the user interfaces must be citizen friendly. And if you ask what we will do differently, I think uh, uh, we might push more for the public services and simplification of a public services so every grandmother can use those public services either for internet and today in the smartphone. And, and the situation today, I think globally is that 90% 90, 90 of the population is connected for smartphone globally and this number will rise. So everything we do for the citizens but also for the businesses, we must consider that it should be available for smartphone and, and user interface is becoming absolutely critical. Every, any service I get, I'd like to get it as a push notification, just clicking yes, yes, and, and done. I don't want to fill up the boring forms with the data what government already has. You know, we, need, we need to have interoperability solution called x in Estonia. We need to have uh, easily usable digital identity also, uh, what everyone can use and easily identify yourself in all government applications, but also for the banking and business. So, so it should be also as simple as possible, but as secure as possible. So, um, 
So I think if you have those elements in place, you can rapidly build up successful government based on your culture, based on your values, and based on trust and communication with your citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. I, I, I will stick to you for one more question. I'm going to take one questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, Roberto, for uh, forwarding to me some of the questions. Uh, this one is for you, Hannes, uh, from Dr. Hugo Mendoza, Universidad Nacional de Asunción. Uh, I'm translating as, as I speak. Uh, how did Estonia or how does Estonia defend from cyber attacks? Very yeah, Thank talk. you very much. Absolutely. Uh, but I should say it's endless topic. Uh, we had cyber attacks yesterday in Estonia. You have cyber attacks today everywhere. We have it everywhere. Each country is under attack. So, so it's a permanent question. I think there is like uh, three aspects what we need to consider. First of all, whatever systems we are designing for the government, we need to think about uh, security from the very beginning. It cannot be in the way that we do information system or any other e-government system, and when we start to build the digital uh, or, or cyber security, we, there should be cyber security by design. We need to think how to decentralize systems to not to any attack cannot take down whole e-government and so on. Secondly, it's also like permanent uh, focus to cyber security. So. Uh, Governments must recognize that cybersecurity is similar treat and natural disasters or military disasters. We need to invest to it. We need to plan the budget for it and, and execute this budget smartly. And finally, our end users, citizens and businessmen who are using our applications, we need to train them also about cybersecurity, about cyber hygiene, because the biggest risk is always the person, not technology itself, but the person. And, um, you know, there is endless cases how uh, bank identity numbers are, or PIN numbers are pitched, pitched from the people like uh, calls, I call from bank, please provide me PIN number, your PIN numbers, you know, we want to verify the transactions, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and still endless number of people, not in Estonia, but globally, they are losing every day hundreds and thousands of dollars. So we need to train those people also make the public aware what is like a basic cyber hygiene and how to how to approach it. So if it follows those three, three main, main lines and there is definitely on the top of it many other issues, I think we can at least basically secure the society. Well explained, Hannes, and, and Estonia is one of those cases where you manage to uh, transform a challenge in an opportunity because cybersecurity has been a challenge from, from the creation of the state in Estonia, as, as you know, because of the proximity of, of the Russians, and that helped you develop a, a strong experience that you're exporting worldwide, and actually that helped you attract the NATO Center of Excellence in cybersecurity, right, in, in Estonia. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna eh, switch back to Spanish. Eh, Maruska, ¿cómo estás? ¿Sigues bien? Aquí, eh, Miguel, <laughs> anotando todo, anotando todo lo que ha comentado sí. Hannes. Sí, duda. estaba, estaba pensando. Comentario. Exacto, estaba pensando en ti con la pregunta de ciberseguridad, porque Perú sí, sí, está sí. en su propio reto ahora de ciberseguridad. Gracias. Eh, yo iba a preguntarte sobre algo que en el, en el libro creo que está está muy, muy bien explicado, que es la parte institucional eh, barra gobernanza. ¿no? Eh, y un poco lo tocó Hannes. Eh, Estonia tiene una agencia que se llama RIA, eh, responsable de la agenda digital, digamos, de Estonia, bajo el Ministerio de Asuntos Económicos y Comunicación, creo que se llama. Eh, de, tú, desde que llegaste a tu responsabilidad en la Secretaría de Gobierno Digital, Hiciste un esfuerzo grande por eh, fortalecer la capacidad de la institución, por, por armar un equipo capaz de liderar esa transformación digital. La pregunta es, eh, ¿crees que Perú eh, debe analizar eh, modelos como el de Estonia, que tiene una agencia, aunque dependa de un ministerio, que tiene una cierta autonomía de funcionamiento? ¿Crees que eso tiene ventajas? ¿Viste algo en el modelo de gobernanza y de institucionalidad de Estonia? que te llame la atención y que quieras explorar un poco más? 
Claro que sí, Miguel. Eh, creo que volviendo un poquito tanto a lo que han comentado de Vindra como Hannes y eh, la última parte de la primera pregunta, todo aquí se debe centrar, creo yo, y compartimos esa, esa, esa idea en la ciudadanía. ¿no? Entonces, el impulso de la ciudadanía digital es la clave. Todas las acciones que desplegamos en entornos digitales, la ciberseguridad, la identidad digital, el poder llevar servicios digitales intuitivos, empáticos, ojalá predictivos, desde el Estado, ¿verdad? Se centran en cómo podemos servir mejor a las personas. Desde esa perspectiva, quiero comentarte dos grandes temas. El primero es la Política Nacional de Transformación Digital, cuyo eje o problema público a resolver es el ejercicio de la ciudadanía digital. Y en cuanto a esto, hay una serie de buenos ejemplos que ha liderado Estonia. Yo te confieso, soy seguidora, tú sabes, de las buenas prácticas internacionales como para nuestro país, en nuestro país tenemos brechas, así que hay que mirar los mejores y comenzamos a tomar. Estonia, México, Uruguay, son, son países que muy de cerca conocemos para llevar adelante este tema. Entonces, si nosotros estamos pensando en un país, mira, 32 millones de ciudadanos en el Perú, de los cuales 3 millones o un poco más hablan quechua, estamos, estamos pensando en un país que necesita inclusión, in, que necesita equidad, ¿Verdad? De ahí la política general de gobierno habla de gobierno, inclusión digital, e inclusión, gobierno y transformación digital con equidad. Y finalmente, esto que comentaba este Hannes sobre si queremos llegar a todos, lleguemos a través del celular, ¿no? La última, el último estudio que se ha revelado en el Perú sobre el avance de la pobreza monetaria indica que las personas que se encuentran en condición de muy pobre tienen un 87% de acceso a Internet a través de celulares. Dicho esto, el modelo de gobernanza que hoy tenemos en el Perú es un modelo que se centra en la presidencia del Consejo de Ministros que depende de la presidencia de la República y que articula los 19 ministerios, todos los ministerios. Por tanto, un carácter transversal. Una secretaría que tiene tres leyes, la ley de gobierno digital, la ley del Sistema Nacional de Transformación Digital y la ley de confianza digital. Hemos crecido, de verdad, y aquí lo digo, gracias al apoyo del BID, hemos tenido una operación que estamos por terminar, y en dos semanas comenzamos la nueva operación, un viaje de los próximos cuatro años. Pero yo creo que nuestro reto todavía es mayor, así que sí, estamos pensando en fortalecer esta gobernanza hacia un camino más institucional en cuanto a eh, administrativo, en cuanto a presupuesto, y en cuanto a poder tener todos los recursos necesarios para llegar hasta el último rincón del país. Gracias, Miguel. De acuerdo, gracias, Maruska. I'm going to switch uh, back to English, Devindra, to uh, uh, retake the dialogue with you. And uh, actually, Maruska mentioned uh, one of the magic words in digital transformation, which is interoperability. Right? Uh, it is hard to build any digital transformation uh, uh, successful project without a solid interoperability scheme. Uh, for those of us that, that uh, on a daily basis uh, work or deal with digital transformation, X road is kind of uh, an omnipresent word, right? Most of us have heard of, of X road, which is the interoperability platform of Estonia. Uh, what, what is your, your view about that uh, building block interoperability in, in Trinidad and Tobago? And do you think that, that you can? build upon the experience of Estonia on X road the Vindra in that in that part. Yeah, thanks Miguel. So I think both the e-identity and X roads, we have linked them very, very tightly. There's some issues and challenges that we need to address specifically in our country. So we have a number of identities, whether that will be driver's permit, birth papers, pin, elections and boundaries, national ID passports. We have a number of databases sitting in different ministries and agencies around the country. They all have differing combinations of those IDs and the data within each of those databases have different quality. So when we start thinking about trying to do things like uh, capture data once and share it, when we start talking about creating services that go across ministries and agencies, we're quite challenged to do it as we speak. The idea here is to take the learnings And again, some of the cybersecurity things that perhaps I get a chance to talk about later also informs that. But the e-identity solution that Estonia has, as well as the interoperability framework, XROAD, is very, very, very critical for us. Now, we are uh, looking at the, uh, right now, and within about two weeks or so, the consultancy will start. 
with Estonia to get the planning going for that and to get the costings and the way that project will shape. We have to adapt it a little bit because we have issues, for example, of trust in government. So citizens will worry if we do put an e-identity in and we start interconnecting through the interoperability framework, are you going to be tracking citizens? So we're dealing with the issue of uh, data protection and whether or not we can keep biometric data stored in our systems. So we're introducing self-sovereign identity layered on the Estonian solution on their e-identity platform together with interoperability and we're crafting a solution together with blockchain or immutable ledgers. So as you use the e-identity to do a transaction, you make an entry into the immutable ledger and you open that up to the, to the citizens and the citizens get an opt-in. So they choose to, to join the system because they're beneficial uses because we're gonna create use cases that you know if you use your e-identity, it'll work better. If you come onto the immutable ledger, you're not happy with how government is using the data, you could remove it. So we're working right now with Estonia to work with the e-identity, self-sovereign identity, interoperability, to try and create an ecosystem that will deal with all of the challenges that we face. And again, we want to do that in an agile way. And Estonia is coming on board with us to work flexibly, to work with the private sector to partner with us. So for example, the banks could use the e-identity for KYC and AML. All of that we build in. Yeah, the free movement of people in the Caribbean, we're hoping the e-identity will allow us to do that. So we build it in a way that the Caribbean uh, countries can share and, and utilize our e-identity. So very, very, very critical um, component that EID and X road. Thank you, Devendra. It, it is encouraging to, to see that approach and the progress you have made. And, and actually, you reminded me that uh, Hannes hasn't done the publicity I thought he was going to do about uh, the EGA Center in the Caribbean region. I will do it for you, Hannes. Probably at, at here everyone knows that EGA has a, a presence in the Caribbean region, which is the presence for the whole region, Latin American and Caribbeans, but the base is in, in Kingston. So we welcome EGA in the region, that, that's great news. Uh, so you get closer to our countries. Uh, you can go into details afterwards, but I did, the, I did the publicity for you. And actually, the Dindra uh, left me the, the topic very well to ask you about something that I was meaning to ask you, which is the e-identity, the EID that you did, that is well described in the book. And it is remarkable the progress you have made. Basically, every Estonian can identify himself or herself over the cell phone, as Maruska was, was saying before. The question for you is, uh, 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 Hannes, is how did you move from uh, uh, enrolling to using? I mean, how did you make the users, the citizens use it, actually? And that probably, I'm, I'm going to put two questions in one. Sorry, then abusing of your generosity, Hannes. But there was a question from uh, Anna Meccano about uh, trust in government, the, the importance of trust in government that relates to this and what Devinda was describing. So how did you make the users uh, actually use the EID? And what role the trust in the government play in that, in that part? Thank you. Go ahead, please, yeah, Hannes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think trust is really a critical issue. And uh, also, I think the trust towards the digital government is related to a general the trust uh, towards the government. And this is pretty high in Estonia. Um, <clears throat> because we must understand that uh, whatever we do in digital, in technically, 99.9% .9 of the people never understand how it's actually functioning. But we can explain it to those who want to understand and at least we need to uh, explain the principles. Also, open conversation is very, um, very much important because if there is a failure, we must communicate it. We cannot hide it because when we hide it, then it's making uh, the things even worse because when people start to be suspicious about us and you know, government is hiding and blah, blah, blah. So in this sense, we, we'd like to say that we have built the trust during the last 20 years but we may, we may lose it in 20 minutes if we are acting wrongly. So cybersecurity and trust are also very much connected. But back to your first question, <clears throat> Miguel, you asked that how we, we managed from enroll, uh, enrollment uh, up to the broad usage. And um, 
enrollment was solved in the way in Estonia that every Estonian citizen is getting ID card. And when he's getting 16 years old, he or she can use start to use the digital part of it also. So by default, every Estonian citizen is having a, a ability to identify him, him or herself, but also provide digital signatures. But this is just a, like an option. So now how we actually made citizens to use it was the case that we collaborated a lot with the banks. So all Estonian major banks are using for the identification and authorization of a payment the same ID card scheme. ID card, mobile ID, smart ID. So actually, banks are training every day our citizens because I think it's in every country in the way that you must make your, your payments in the bank at least once per month. You need, need to pay your utility bills and whatever more. But you deal with the government probably, I don't know, five, six, seven times per, per year only and, and hectically or randomly. So so I think the key is that if we can uh, ask our uh, stakeholders and, and key partners like banks, telecoms, all utility providers who need to uh, deal with a massive part of the population to use the same identity scheme, this will be the win-win situation. And this has been the key for the, this kind of win-win uh, situation in Estonia. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. And, and actually, uh, let me uh, keep, keep with you for, for, um, for, for one, one more question, and then I'll go back to Marushka and Devindra. You are also very creative in Estonia, and you launch uh, a couple, at least two initiatives that I know that are quite pioneer, quite original, and have been studied worldwide. One is the e-residency, uh, and the other one is the... Uh, you call it like the digital embassies, I think, right? The one you launch in uh, in uh, Extras World, uh, I believe, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit about both? Uh, what, can you explain to to the audience uh, what they consist of, and uh, if you're happy with the results or the success? Thank you, Hannes. Yeah, thank you. Starting from e-residency. E-residency is an opportunity for foreign citizens to register themselves as a online residents of Estonia, and this will provide them an opportunity to establish a business in Estonia and use all online opportunities of online banking about online reporting to the government and run the business. Definitely there are limitations because you know KYC money laundering is a really hot topic so so it maybe it's not as beautiful as it was planned 10 years ago, but world has changed. So anyway, this has, has attracted a lot of, uh, especially young entrepreneurs from the countries with maybe not that good business environment to start up their companies in Estonia. It doesn't bring provide you Estonian tax residency. It's not providing you Estonian citizenship, but at least it's providing you Estonian business environment. So we say it's large scale experiment. It started around 10 years ago. We don't know where it leads us, but we hope it provides us with some interesting experience and then attention as today. <laughs> the second uh, uh, data embassy is the concept that um, it's probably not a good idea to keep all the data only inside your country because you may have natural disasters, you may have uh, whatever military issues like we see currently in Ukraine, and that many governments still don't want to put their data to cloud. What is another topic that should be discussed also? But the data embassy is, is the concept that as Estonia, as embassy, either in US, either in Germany, either in some other country, the embassy territory is your national territory uh, protected by various laws. So the idea is that to set up like a microscopic data center in one or another um, embassy territory, what could save your data from various risks? Either they are copies what are sent uh, to, to the embassy every month or every week of the key databases, or is it like more advanced solution what is synchronizing already main data sets in real time? So, but again, it's just to avoid the risk that uh, during the natural disaster, what is very common in Caribbean region, as we know, or military conflict, what well, is also relevant in our region, as we all now understand better <laughs> after Russian aggression to Ukraine, 
So we need to think about these things, but cloud is definitely also a very good solution, what should be discussed as an as a option uh, for uh, in the closest years for every government. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. It, it makes a lot of sense to me, and I'm sure some other countries listening uh, will, will follow on, on those steps. Uh, Marushka, uh, uh, vuelvo, vuelvo contigo ahora. Um, Tú mencionaste muy bien que estás eh, ahora trabajando en, en el nuevo proyecto de, de, de empuje de la agenda digital en, en Perú y estamos desde el banco muy agradecidos por la oportunidad de trabajar con el gobierno de Perú y de apoyar al gobierno de Perú en esta, en esta nueva fase de la transformación digital. La pregunta es muy sencilla. Imagínate que, que tienes la capacidad de que tienes un, un mago que te protege y te dice, elige tres cosas de Estonia que te puedes llevar para Perú mañana, adaptarlas y modificarlas a la cultura y realidad de Perú. ¿Qué tres cosas de las muchas que se ven en Estonia y que están en la publicación te llama la atención como para explorar y profundizar y tratar de ver si puedes hacer tu propia versión de esas tres cosas en, en Perú? Gracias, Miguel. Había ido pensando varias, pero ahorita que escucho a Hannes, he anotado otras más. Eh, en primer lugar, creo que esta mirada que acaba de, de explicar Hannes y que también desde de esa perspectiva fortaleció de Vindra, eh, este y que además es coyuntural en nuestro país en este momento, este enfoque de la ciberseguridad desde el diseño, esta, este pensar que ayer tuve un ataque, hoy voy a tener otro ciberataque y lo voy a tener siempre, ¿no? Entonces, y, ta, y darle la categoría de, eh, de la seguridad para toda la nación, yo creo que es fundamental, es... Eh, todo avance digital tiene este riesgo y sabemos que tenemos el reto presupuestal y sabemos el reto que tenemos, que tenemos el reto de conocimiento, no de talento digital. Entonces, primero, toda la experiencia de ciberseguridad la replicaría mañana y si pudiera ¿no? este, tener todo este conocimiento con todo el equipo de Estonia aquí, lo haría. Punto número dos, y, y aprovechando la primera, es el tema del talento digital. Esto que ha comentado Hannes es también, nosotros lo, lo escuchamos cuando vino el expresidente de Estonia acá, y es cómo se apalanca el Estado para poder garantizar que el talento digital lo impulse el sector privado. No este tema de que, claro, en el año yo puedo hacer cuatro trámites con el Estado, ¿no? y, pero en el año hago todos los meses, hago transacciones con los bancos, con las empresas telco, me parece espectacular. Entonces, en esa línea, en el Perú, tenemos una ley que eh, fortalece el laboratorio de gobierno de transformación digital y hemos venido trabajando muy de la mano con eh, la asociación de bancos, con las empresas de telecomunicaciones, para garantizar, por ejemplo, el impulso de billeteras digitales. Y eso nos ha permitido todo lo que involucra la, recibir bonos, eh, incentivos eh, dentro de la, de la crisis sanitaria. Así que lo segundo que haría sería eso, ¿no? Tomar ese modelo público-privado de impulsar el trento digital con aplicaciones sencillas. Y lo último, que ya eh, me parece eh, súper bueno que acaba de comentar sobre las embajadas digitales, nosotros trabajamos en el Perú con eh, nubes, nu nubes privadas, nubes públicas, pero esto, este tema de tener eh, tu territorio en otro país, porque las embajadas son un territorio ¿no? del país, me parece extraordinario, así que eso también lo tomaría Miguel. Buenísimo. Le diste mucho trabajo a, a tu mago porque tiene muchas cosas para ayudarte a, a adoptar la historia. Pero sí. seg seguramente se van a dar con, con el apoyo de, de Hannes y los buenos amigos que tenemos en Estonia. Gracias, Maruska. Eh, Devindra, eh, I'll, I'll go back to you. I'm, I'm probably actually looking at the, at the clock. It's going to be maybe your, your last uh, intervention. Eh, I was... Uh, uh, about to ask you about cybersecurity. I know Trinidad and Tobago has been one of the, of the pioneers in setting up a, a CSIRT uh, several years ago, actually. Uh, but uh, according to the report that, that the IDB and the OAS uh, uh, published in, in 2020, there's uh, some things to, to strengthen in cybersecurity in, in Trinidad and Tobago. Did you see good references in Estonia, things that called your attention that you would like to uh, Trinidad and Tobago to explore further and uh, hopefully take advantage of? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. So I think we do have a pretty robust TTC cert um, that sits in the Ministry of National Security. But quite recently, I think Trinidad and Tobago has become the target for cyber attacks. We have had cases of ransomware in some local banks 
Uh, we have had the point system in the big national supermarket attacked as well and their solutions went down. So we know it's inevitable and it's coming very soon that um, government will become uh, you know, uh, another critical um, point that will be attacked. So what we have started to do is to revamp and to relook how we are addressing the, the issues of cybersecurity. And we're also looking at the issues that will now arise when we introduce the identity and the challenges that if those become you know, um, compromised, the interconnections through XROs or the interoperability framework, and therefore we're exposing other ministries that may have been isolated through that connectivity. So we have looked quite closely at what Estonia has done, and we have looked at the resilience of their systems and how that evolved since 2007 when they were attacked. We looked at um, how the private sector has been engaged in the conversation, the training that's provided, the maturity of the technology that um, is provided through the EID as well as X-Roads, and, and the issues around transparent and open dialogue with citizens when the countries do get attacked. And we want to bring that into the conversation and to start looking at a new national cybersecurity strategy. So our work has started with that and we're working with IDB and others and getting that started. And the implications of that e-identity and interoperability framework and how we can restructure ourselves to support both the government and its initiatives as well as the country at large. So we're hoping to take the best practices of Estonia and any other uh, sort of environments, but primarily building on what advice we get from Estonia. So uh, we're very sensitive to it, very, very critical, and uh, we have brought that to the top of the list for us to focus on in the coming months. Thank you, Devendra, and thank you for letting the IDB to, to work with you and to support you in generally the digital agenda and in particular in cybersecurity. Thank you. Marushka, before I go back to Hannes, eh, Antes de, de pasar a Hannes, voy a hacer una paradita en ti para darte, si quieres, un par de minutos para eh, pues compartir lo, el último mensaje que quieras compartir eh, a, a Estonia, a Hannes, a la región, al banco, eh, sobre tu agenda digital, tus planes, tu equipo y, y cómo podemos ayudar a Perú entre todos. Claro que sí, Miguel. Primero, muchísimas gracias. De verdad que además de participar, que para nosotros es un honor estar en este panel y en este evento, el escuchar a Hannes, a Devindra y claro a ti, Miguel, es para nosotros una, una, un gran fortalecimiento, primero, de que estamos yendo en el camino correcto, de que estamos tomando las mejores experiencias y de que nuestro país, con los retos que tenemos geográficos, eh, bueno, vamos a lograr llevar adelante esta agenda digital. Nuestra agenda se basa en la Política Nacional de Transformación Digital, que además se inspira mucho en los ejemplos de países, como les comentaba, eh, como Estonia, por ejemplo, y países que han llevado adelante el, el concepto de inclusión, de ciudadanía digital y de gobierno y transformación digital con equidad. Y punto número dos, dentro de esta política existen cinco, cinco estrategias prioritarias dentro de las que se encuentran la seguridad y confianza digital, inteligencia artificial, gobierno de datos, todo el impulso del talento digital y todo lo que necesitamos impulsar también para la economía digital. Eh, nuestra agenda estará marcada por la Política Nacional de Transformación Digital, hoy está marcada por la Política General de Gobierno, en Gobierno y Transformación Digital con Equidad, pero al final del día de lo que se trata es de poner las tecnologías al servicio de la ciudadanía. Y creo que eso compartimos todos en este panel. Miguel, muchas gracias. Gracias, Marusca. Totalmente de acuerdo. Eh, Hannes, um... I think this is going to be the last question. So it is, it is uh, very important for the region. And, and uh, the question that, uh, or more, more than the question, the answer that we want to hear is, what do the countries in our region, Latin America and the Caribbean regions, uh, need to do uh, to look similar to uh, e Estonia in the near future? I would put a, a time frame, but in the near future, to look quite similar to Estonia, not, not for the sake of digital, but for the sake of a country that is able to provide services to their citizens uh, in an efficient manner. That, that's what we're looking for here. So please give us, give us a roadmap. We're all listening in the region. Thank you, Hannes. And actually, this will be your last, uh, your last intervention. We have five minutes and I have to be sharp in another meeting afterwards. So if you want to just close as, 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 uh, as well as, as answering the question, thank you. Hans. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much. I'm like in the role of a god currently, so giving kind of universal advice how to move forward. But, but no, I think it's 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 still very simple. First of all, democratic values should be in place, and democratic governance very much always supporting uh, digital government development also because it's about transparency, it's about citizens and businesses and stakeholders engagement and. Uh, a lot of focus to technology, but more focus even to organization, uh, political will, driving the changes, change management, simplifying the life of the citizens. What you can do best for the citizens, not only build the roads, but, but also build the super highways for the digital communication. So there is so many things to do. And we are happy to continue with support. We established uh, recently uh, um, a doctor company in Jamaica, what is now becoming more and more functional. And uh, we really hope to make it as a hub for the, for the knowledge sharing. Uh, most probably as initial phase, it will be manned mainly from Estonia, but as more and more we do uh, in the region, more and more local experts, we will involve there also in close future. So do not hesitate to, to contact us. We are happy to share we are we are happy to share the experiences and and really happy to be Estonian today. And thanks for you, Miguel, Devindra, and Marushka making me in this position. So, so um, but it's just the beginning of a journey. Many things are ahead. We can do everything jointly much better than it is today, much securely. And and this is the aim. And we all believe in Estonia that if some country is becoming better than in Estonia in digital transformation, we are becoming jealous and trying to do again us better. So it will be very good competition. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, very nice message to wrap it up. Actually, um, thank you, Devindra Ramnarin. Uh, thank you to you and your government for, for joining us and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Thank you, Maruska Chocobar, to you and, and the government of Peru for joining us and for this exchange. And thank you, Hannes Astok. Uh, actually, thank you for projecting the publication. The main uh, focus of this exchange was the fact that our region has now a very important piece of knowledge in Spanish, which is, uh, you can download it right there, uh, AIDD.org, Transformación Digital Estonia. Uh, available in Spanish. It was available in English uh, because IGA published it originally in English. For me, it was a pleasure. As usual, I learned a lot by having this exchange with you. I thank the audience for massively joining the, the activity and for the questions. I use as many as I could. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, Hannes, Marushka, Devindra, and the audience. And uh, I yield back to you, Roberto, to, to close the activity. Thank you, everyone. Gracias. gracias, Miguel. Muchas gracias a todos y todas por estar presentes en este evento, por las preguntas que hemos recibido, por la, el compromiso de, de los expositores y del moderador. Eh, el recordatorio muy especial a que descarguen el libro, que está, la publicación que está, cuya dirección está en el chat y que nos volvamos a ver en otras actividades del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo para fomentar y difundir la transformación digital en América Latina y el Caribe. Que tengan un buen día. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Muchas gracias.